You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. I want to welcome to the Final Say Radio Show, and thank you so much for joining us, Deborah Weiss, Esquire. She works for Vigilance, which is an organization dedicated to raising awareness of nonviolent radical Islam. And she is uh, considered an expert in the concept of combating defamation of religions. Previously, she was a Manhattan director for the, for the Forbes for President campaign, served as a counsel for the Committee on House Oversight in Congress, and worked as an assistant corporation counsel in the Giuliani administration. She was contributing author to the book Saudi Arabia and the Global Islamic Terrorist Network, and is primary writer and research on the uh, recently released book titled Council on American Islamic Relations, Its Use of Lawfare and Intimidation. She's also a regular contributor to the Washington Times and Front Page Magazine and numerous other publications. By the way, Ms. Weiss is a survivor of 9-11, the terrorist attacks on New York City, and she is now our, well, she's also our friend, but she's now a guest with us today. And Debbie, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining John and I. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Well, if we can start off just for the audience, uh, for those who may not be aware of what CARE is and what their main goal is, if you could uh, give us a little bit of background on them, that would be great. Yeah. CARE holds itself out as a moderate civil rights organization who works on behalf of Muslims, but in reality it's a Muslim Brotherhood front group. It's spawned out of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which are both state designated terrorist organizations. And it's basically the propaganda wing of Hamas and it exists primarily in the US and Canada. It was also an unindicted co conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation trial, which was the largest terror financing trial in the history of the United States. And I would say that it's Primary goals are, one, is to stifle all criticism of Islam, even if it's true. So, for example, if you say that 9-11 was committed by Islamic terrorists, then you're an Islamophobe. They want to have you dissociate anything, any interpretation of Islam from terrorist behavior. They want to Islamize the workplace and other societal institutions like corporations and get special preferences which are not afforded to Jews or Christians or atheists, and to hamper and undermine American national security. I would say those are their three main goals. Mm, That's incredible. Now, Hamas, of course, is on the terrorist list. I I hope they still are, unless unless (laughs) that executive order has happened. (laughs) Yes, they are. And, of course, Hamas, and and then you have Hezbollah, and then you have the the PLO, and, and these are all three extreme and dangerous terrorist organizations which surround the country that we all love, Israel. And they also, like you've mentioned, have kind of branched out into the United States, and they've gained and garnered a lot of influence in major cities, including Washington, D.C. Right. Well, Hamas, actually there are Hamas and Hezbollah cells in the United States, and those are violent cells that want to use violent tactics. The difference with CARE and Hamas, uh, I mean, Hamas uses different tactics. They use nonviolent tactics. So they'll do things like file frivolous lawsuits, which they know they're not going to win, but they do it to intimidate the other side, to bleed them dry, and to shut them up. They'll do things like pressure organizations to cancel speakers that have viewpoints that they don't want the audience to hear. They do things like call anybody a bigot or an Islamophobe if they talk about Islamic terrorism or Islamic persecution of religious minorities in the Middle East or discrimination against women under Sharia law, then they'll call you names. They try to smear the reputations of individuals, politicians, or corporations uh, if they don't comply with their demands. They'll harass, intimidate, boycott organizations, Um, make veiled threats, and inundate them with phone calls, emails, letter-writing campaigns, and and various tactics like that. So that's the main difference between Hamas proper and and care. But their their goals and their philosophy are identical. So, Debbie, here's an interesting question for you, okay? I 
can give a pass to a lot of American citizens who just maybe don't get and don't understand all the issues that are going on. Okay, they should be aware, but they aren't. But there are so many members in Congress, the president himself, people who have access to the intelligence and the and it is their job and it's their staff's job to inform them of what's going on in the world. So I want to get your opinion on this. I can only think of four basic reasons why we would allow such things to occur. One is fear. Two is complicity, meaning you agree with them. Three is blindness, meaning you're somehow dull, have no senses, you know, have not the capacity to reason. The fourth is greed, meaning all they have to do is show up with the money bags and will cater to them. Do you have a sense as to which one of these or which two of these may be the, the bulk of the reason why our own leaders are allowing CARE and many other organizations work with them to get away with this? Oh, you know, you made some very good points, Brett. I actually think you're correct. Those are, are probably the four main reasons. And I don't think you can point to any one and generalize for all Congress members. I mean, as we know, there were five that spoke out and asked for an investigation of infil- Islamist infiltration into our government, and they were skewered. They were absolutely screwed just for asking a question. They didn't even state a conclusion. Uh, so there are some that are aware and want something done about it, and I think it's on a, on a case-by-case basis. You know, there is willful blindness. There are people who uh, might have spouses or other contacts. For example, CARE, CARE itself doesn't donate to congressional campaigns, but certainly CARE leadership as individuals does, and they'll, they'll know where that money came from. So sometimes it's funding for campaigns. Sometimes it's they have other issues that they focus on. I mean, not all congressmen are focused on national security. Some are focused on more on agriculture or areas that don't touch upon these issues as much. Um, and sometimes it's complicity. I hate to say it, but in the case of the president, I think he's on the wrong side on this issue. I, I can't believe that he wouldn't know. I mean, when he first came to office, and he had some wrong policies or seemed to be excluding Israel or saying things that most Americans on a bipartisan basis wouldn't agree with, I thought, you know, I tried to give him every benefit of the doubt and think maybe he just doesn't know better, lacks the experience. (coughs) Excuse me. But as time went on, if you follow this issue of Islamist infiltration, And if you look at how he handles Middle East politics and his treatment of Israel and uh, the persecution of Christians in the Middle East, it is time after time after time after policy after policy after policy that he's constantly on the Islamist side versus the side of freedom. And it cannot be a coincidence because even a broken clock is right twice a day and this president gets it wrong every time. If you look at his background, I think it explains a lot. One way or another, he is absolutely sympathetic to the Islamist cause. The comments that he himself makes, for example, in Cairo in 2009, where his staff purposely filled the audience with Muslim Brotherhood members, he said, quote, it is my job as President of the United States to fight negative stereotyping of Islam, not of Muslims, notice, of Islam, wherever they might be, unquote. Now, I'm a lawyer. I went to law school, and I don't remember learning that that's one of the jobs of the United States President. Then, two years ago, at the United Nations, he said, quote, the future does not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam, unquote. And then he and Hillary Clinton actually spent $70,000 in Pakistan to show ads to the public there slamming that quote-unquote anti-Islam video that they said was the cause of the uprisings in Libya, which we now know is a falsehood entirely. But it's just time after time after time he expresses empathy, sympathy. Uh, Recently, a few years ago, every federal agency completely purged its lexicon from all mention of Islamic terrorism or Islamist ideology. This was done largely due to pressure from CARE. And now national security professionals and counterterrorism experts are not learning about the Islamist ideology that motivates attacks. 
you know, they tell them to focus on terrorist behavior and to delink it from the underlying ideology. And this is very dangerous. Anybody who knows anything about national security knows that you have to understand your enemy, what its goals are, what its objectives are, what its tactics are, and if you want to catch it before it happens, you have to understand why they're doing it and not just focus on the terrorist behavior because that's a symptom of it's an expression of their ideology. It's the last step. So it would be like saying years ago, oh, we're fighting Russia, but we're not fighting communism. I mean, it's just it's, exactly. it's ridiculous. That's, that, that's absolutely correct. And, uh, you know, I have a copy of the 9-11 report that was done. And it's an extremely thick book. And to be honest with you, I've only thumbed through it. But I know what's going to happen, and you can predict it. We're going to have another attack that will happen, and then everybody will come out and say, well, how did this happen? We have to get into the bottom of this and investigate it, and there will be another report of a 1,000 pages long, and another book will be issued that will tell us all about it. And you and I are sitting here saying exactly what the issue is, and but they choose to ignore it. And I understand the administration is wholeheartedly responsible for a lot of this, but it goes very deep within, I think, several of the political ideologies. It's, it, it's liberalism, it's progressivism, it's, you know, a lot of the other isms have made this shift. And I think you could just look at, in Washington, D.C., when you look at all the new buildings that are going up and being built, they're being built by foreign money, and it's a significant influence, and it's making its ways into the coffers of the people who are, who are sitting in Washington. Another thing I wanted to say, uh, Deborah, is when you... Look, when you think from the perspective of the American person, national security is, you know, I don't know how many people actually make it such an important issue because I think it's a small number, but foreign policy, most people don't care about foreign policy, unfortunately. You and I do, and John does, and, and our listeners most likely do. But the average American is worried about, uh, you know, the price of gas, how much bread costs, and, and you know, w which mayor is sleeping with whatever, and, and what's on the front page of their paper. They can't go beyond that, and that's unfortunate, and that's why I think administrations like this and the Carter administration and even, and even the Bush administration to some degree get away with some of the nonsensical decisions that get made. Sure. Information is power. And okay. part of the reason that CARE and the o Organization of Islamic Cooperations and other Islamist organizations are trying to shut down discussion on these topics instead of debating the issues on the merits, they want to shut down the debate entirely, is to keep the audience in the dark and to prevent them from knowing what's going on. Because if they don't know what's going on, then they'll be powerless to do anything about it. I also think you're correct that there's what David Horowitz refers to as mm -hmm. an unholy alliance between Islamists and liberals. I mean, you would never suspect that liberals who are always claiming that they're for... Uh, gay rights and women's rights and everybody's rights would form an alliance with those who want Sharia law, which persecutes women and hangs gays, and yet they have a common bond, which is basically, uh, you know, sort of anti-American. And I think that some of them have that alliance because they are anti-American. But I do also think that you're correct over time the PC issues have really taken hold in this country in the last several years since 9-11. And I'm sure you know that the 9-11 Commission would not have been able to issue a report that it, that it did that mentions Islamic terrorism and Islamic ideology all the time. And now you can't talk about it. And I think there are a lot of people, I've met people, who do not understand the importance of free speech, who do not understand that without that pinnacle, there is no other freedom. If you don't have the freedom to dissent, if you don't have the freedom to voice unpopular viewpoints, and certainly if you don't have the freedom to discuss legitimate concerns of Islamic terrorism, persecution of religious minorities, or human rights violations committed in the name of Islam, then you really, the, no other freedom can possibly exist. And I think that... Um, it's really gotten to a point where there are people who, you know, it sounds good. It sounds good. You know, let's not say anything mean about any Muslims. Let's not say, oh, we should all be nice. We shouldn't discuss it. You know, and the consequence is that they, on one hand, are saying, 
you know, CARE and organizations like them are saying that we shouldn't discuss it, but they're not telling the terrorists or the people persecuting Christians and Jews in the Middle East, they're not telling them to stop that. They're just telling us not to report it, not to mention it. We're Islamophobes if we discuss it. That's well, obvious now. We've heard, and I will tell you that it, you are seeing what's happening in America. In the, I, I lost him. Close well, a side. Uh, yeah, sorry, John, go, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. sorry, John, you're you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, Deborah, John's in Israel right now, and he's probably having a little hard time uh, with this signal. Okay. Uh, we, we have a few minutes left with you, and, and of course, Deborah, we love having you on, and you're always welcome to come on, and we'd like to have you on sooner than later, because uh, you, you do you really do such important work, and you investigate oh, you. things. And I love when we go to an event and hearing you speak on panels. Uh, I, even all the reading we do, we always learn something wonderful from you. Oh, thank you uh, so much. But here, here's a question uh, that I would have right now. Uh, we see the, you know, you have elections that just happened in Egypt, um, where this administration, as you even mentioned just before, pushed, and I think are, were strongly behind uh, Morsi taking power and Mubarak being removed. I think that was this administration's uh, pushing. And, of course, the people in Egypt said, no, we're not going to have this, and, and they went back to the streets, and now... You have uh, the new president who will take over. And that, that's, I guess, a good sign. But when you look at all this and you look at an organization like CARE and in what's transpiring uh, in Syria and the Iranian influence and Turkey becoming ever more extreme, what do you think um, as, the, you know, we're coming, I guess you could almost say like this, Administration has two years left to do hopefully minimal damage, but as the election and someone like Hillary Clinton and whoever is going to run on the Republican side and they start um, speaking vocally as they're uh, you know trying to get their names and their faces and their ideas out there, do you think that there'll be pushback from where we've been heading, or are they going to continue to support these ideas of, that CARE is pushing and, and some of the other uh, organizations like that? Well, unfortunately, some of the policies are already in place, and they've now taken on a life of their own. Um, for example, as I think I discussed the last time I was on your show, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation that has uh, been yeah. pushing U.N. resolutions to stifle all criticism of Islam has been um, gone through an implementation process now, which is uh, virtually unheard of in the past. And it was spearheaded by our State Department and Hillary Clinton to, uh, you know, they've changed all the policies. I mean, I guess we're short on time, so I'll just say, you know, all those agencies that I mentioned that have purged the lexicon, it's, it's, con it's unlikely that the lexicon will come back. I mean, that's already there. The programs where they have the interfaith outreach and they train people to ignore signs if they're Muslim, all of that is already in place. So I think it would be hard to undo it. However, I also think that it's unlikely that, whomever we get as president, Democrat or Republican, that it will be, they will be as bad as this administration. It would be very hard to be as bad as this administration. And until recently, uh, pro -Israel, a pro-Israel stance, for the most part, was a bipartisan position. I do believe that there are Democrats as well as Republicans who are still pro-Israel, who do understand the importance of free speech, and, um, you know, I guess we didn't get to talk about some of the examples I wanted to regarding care uh, proper, but I really want the audience to understand, if they take away nothing else, that there's a movement of Islamist organizations that are here to undermine American freedom and the American way of life, and that it, I understand, you're right, people are busy, they have jobs, they have their family, they're not thinking about national security. But if you look throughout history and around the world, freedom is the exception. It's not the rule. The American Constitution was considered an experiment in freedom. And if we do sit by, whether it's out of complacency or out of fear or out of willful blindness, it will be endangered. And there is a chance that we could lose it. And once that happens, we won't get it back. So if you can only take one do one thing a week 
bring a friend to a panel, forward an article, get a discussion going with your children, with your friends, with your neighbors, discuss it at dinner time. It's important that you educate yourself, educate your others, hold your elected account, uh, officials accountable, make sure that your churches aren't having events where they have a care representative on a panel and give them, give them legitimacy, and do whatever you can to not capitulate to care, not to shut up, and to remember that you have a constitutional right to free speech and a secure country, and I think that's critical. Absolutely. Uh, well, Deborah Weiss, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on again, and uh, you're always welcome on this program, and we know that every day that you are out there working so hard to educate people and not only standing up for the national security interests of this country, but for our friends and allies, specifically Israel and others, and you do great work, and I just want to thank you on behalf oh, of us. Oh, thank you so much, and, uh, and I appreciate your work as well by having the show and educating everybody in your audience. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Take care. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. All right.